The text is taken from Psalm 90, verses 10 through 17. These are the words of God. The days of our years are three score and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children, and let the beauty of the Lord be upon us, the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Our Father and God, this is your book, your word, all of it. We pray now that you would feed and nourish us in your word, by your word, and according to your word. We thank you for it now, looking forward in faith to what we are about to receive. We pray this way because we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and amen. Amen. So we've come now to the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation began 500 years ago. What I want to do is remind you of certain key elements in that Reformation, what that Reformation was all about, and then address the meaning of time and anniversaries. What are we doing when we commemorate things like this? When we mark 500 years, when we mark one year, when we mark 1,000 years, what are we doing? Recall that 500 years is 8% of human history. These, these issues are not insignificant trifles, and they are not only 8% of human history, but they are the most uh, recent influential parts of history in, with regard to our day, with regard to our time. So how we mark time, how we mem- remember time, how we think about time matters a great deal. On average, according to the text, on average, we are assigned 70 years, verse 10, and 80 years by reason of strength sometimes, also verse 10. But even in that strength, there is labor, sorrow, and vanity. If you live a long time, that means you've got more aches and pains. It is soon cut off, and we fly away, verse 10. We have this struggle because of the anger of God. God is, God is displeased with the rebellion of this world, with the rebellion of the people in it, And so consequently, the world does not cooperate with us the way it would had Adam and Eve never fallen. When God withholds his hand, when God does not chastise us, we we run riot in our lusts. But when God chastises, when God uh, cracks down, it often seems to land heavily on the ones who seek to acknowledge him. In other words, God chastises us, God chastises the world, but oftentimes the the blows fall on those who would appear, according to his word, to be his favorites. What is he doing there? Verse 11. In Hebrews 12, 6, uh, it, it tells believers not to be discouraged when they are scourged by God. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days have the days of my life been. That's from Genesis 47, 9. Few and evil. I've lived 130 years, and my days were few and evil. It cannot be denied that God frequently loads up his favorites with troubles. But there's a deep purpose in it. What did David have to go through? What did Job have to go through? What, what, did, uh, what did Jesus have to go through? Jesus was perfect, and he was God's beloved son. What did God... It it is false to say that if you are pleasing to God, if you are walking with God, if you are loved by God, that you will therefore have no troubles. That is false. Our response, in in fact, that that was the error that Job's false comforters fell into. Job's having all this trouble; he must have sinned. Or the man born blind in the Gospels, where. Uh, The the disciples asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? If you're in trouble, then you must be in trouble for something that is your fault, your individual fault. 
And the Bible teaches that that is not necessarily so. The Bible also teaches that God is not mocked and a man reaps what he sows. The Bible teaches that, that if someone lives in a dissolute way, they're going to reap a, they're going to reap a crop that, that, that it accords with what they planted. That's true too. But what you can't do is say this is automatically so. You can't say that if there's trouble, there's sin. If there's trouble, there is sin in that person's life upstream. No. God is, our, our response to all of this, and this is our point, to request that God use all of it to teach us about time. When we go through trouble, it seems like when you're in trouble, when you're in anguish, when you're in difficulty, when you're in pain, pain, it seems like it goes on forever. And God is teaching us about time. Time. He's teaching us to trust him in history, in our lives, in time. Teach us to number our days so that we might behave with wisdom. Verse 12. Teach us to number our days. So this world is a messed up place. You're going to go through a lot of difficulty. The fact that you are loved by God, the fact that you are beloved of God, does not automatically exempt you from those troubles. As it says in the book of Job, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Affliction is intended to teach wisdom. Now, for a fool, it doesn't. Affliction brought to a fool just hardens him in that folly. Affliction brought to a wise man teaches wisdom. But though God has good purposes for loading us up with troubles, we are still within bounds to ask him to stay his hand. When we're in trouble, when we're in affliction, we know what direction to pray. Paul had a thorn in his flesh, and he asked God to remove it. But Paul didn't have a thorn in his flesh and then say, well, God has a good purpose for this, so I, I should ask him to increase the pain. That's not the direction Paul prayed. Paul prayed that it would be removed, and he was content when God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. So we know what direction to pray. We know what direction to go. And it is lawful and right and biblical for us to pray for relief. When we are in affliction, we pray for deliverance. When we are going through, when we feel like we're being ground up, we, we want to pray to God to, to bring us through to the other side. That's lawful and right. That's ordinary. That's human. That's biblical. So we are within bounds to ask God to stay his hand. Verse 13. In the midst of all our labor and sorrow... If God grants our request, then we, then we will rejoice and be glad all of our days. Verse 14. If God grants relief from our trouble, then we are going to rejoice and be glad all our days. Our request ascends to the very pinnacle of faith. Make us glad, he says in verse 15, make us glad according to the days of our affliction. There is a correspondence between the days of your affliction and the days of gladness. And, and if we number our days rightly, we see that correspondence. We apprehend by faith that God has a good purpose in this. When God is taking us through the ringer, when God is giving us, loading us up with sorrow and labor and difficulty, when God is doing this, we oftentimes don't have any idea of what God is up to. There's no way that you could anticipate or guess. Think, go, go back to Jacob's comment, I've lived 130 years, few and evil have been my days. When Jacob was going through the most evil thing that he went through, which was the loss of Joseph, all right, he was trusting God, he was walking with God, but he'd lost Joseph, he'd lost Joseph. And he did not anticipate, he could never have anticipated that while Joseph was gone, to death, so he thought, Joseph was actually becoming the ruler of Egypt, right? Now think about that for a minute. When, when the brothers came back and told Jacob that this was, it was in fact what happened, Jacob did not, could not take it in. It, it took some persuading that this is what had actually happened to Joseph. Joseph was going through few and evil days, and he comes, he comes out at the last into the land of Goshen with his descendants around him, a family restored. He, he sees all of this restored at the end, and he could not have anticipated that in the midst of his trouble. So, make us glad according to the days of our affliction. Now, think about that. If you say God, if you pray that God would shrink the affliction, if you pray that God would make it a, sort of a nanosecond, maybe you know, a mild headache, maybe. Let's just shrink it down. What you're asking God to do, 
is shrink down the days of gladness, right? The deliverance, the deliverance that God is bringing us to is in accordance with the days of our affliction. And if we number our days cr correctly, we see that. So we pray that God would show his work to his servants and to their children. Verse 16, remember that children and grandchildren are one of the central ways for us to number our days across generations. You, you have an impact. You will have an impact on future human history, and your primary impact on that history is going to be through your children, through your grandchildren. Is, uh, some, some of you will have an impact beyond your family, but those of you who have descendants are going to have, that's going to be the primary way that you influence future generations, and that's part of what it, learns, what it means to learn wisdom in numbering your days. So then, with all of this in mind, may the beauty of the Lord, may the beauty of the Lord rest upon us. May his beauty adorn our labor, sorrow, affliction, and gladness, and consequently establish it. God's beauty rests on sorrow as much as on gladness. God's beauty adorns affliction as much as it adorns rejoicing. So God establishes the work of our hands, and the work of our hands goes through much sorrow, toil, pain, sadness. It goes, th it goes through a lot, and God's beauty rests on all of it. Now, I'm going to appear for a moment to be changing the subject, but I'm not, not at all changing the subject. I want to remind you about the solas, the, the five solas of the Reformation. One wiseacre once asked why they are called solas, since there are five of them. What's, what's with five solas? But if you meditate on them in wisdom, and you see instantly how they all harmonize in one gospel. It's no more a contradiction than Paul's statement that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. These are all one Lord, one faith, one baptism, all converge in one gospel, one message of salvation, one proclamation of salvation. So we believe in sola scriptura. This means that scripture is our only infallible and ultimate authority. Scripture is not the only spiritual authority we have uh, because we have church government, you have parents, you have pe people in authority over you, but they're not infallible and they're not ultimate. The only infallible ultimate authority is the Bible. So we believe in sola scriptura. We believe in sola fide, which means that we are saved through the sole instrument of faith in Jesus Christ. It's not faith and works. It's not works with a minimum of faith. It's faith alone. Faith, it's not faith that is alone, but it's faith alone that is the instrument of receiving God's gift. Faith alone does not mean that faith alone is not accompanied. It means that nothing joins with it in the work of receiving God's gift. And that work is simply trusting him, simply believing him. We affirm sola gratia, which teaches that it is the grace of God alone that moved him to save us. Nothing that we did contributed to it. God did not look down the corridors of time, see us making wise and good choices, and then because we were so much better than the other guy, choose us. That's not how it happened. God did not see us exercising free will. He did not see us making good choices. He did not see us wanting him autonomously. Everything that he saw us doing that was worthwhile is what he determined to give to us. So we love him because he first loved us, not the other way around. It's not God loving us because we first loved him. It's sola gratia. God saves by grace alone. We have one Savior, solus Christus. Jesus Christ alone is our Messiah. Jesus Christ alone is our Savior. Jesus Christ alone is our deliverance. And all of these things together redound to the glory of God alone, soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. So, sola script, scriptura, this is our sole, ultimate, infallible authority for in matters of faith and practice. We have one instrument of receiving God's gift, which is faith. God saves us by his grace alone, with no contribution from us. Jesus Christ is our only Savior. There is one way to heaven, and that is through the proclaimed name of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and all of this glorifies God. Now, all of this is right at the heart of what was recovered in the Reformation. 
There were elements of this in bits and pieces in, in church history before that. But in the Reformation, it all came into focus. When the Reformation started, these things were articulated clearly, powerfully, and across uh, and all across Europe. In other words, it all came into focus. It all came down at one time, and everybody saw. This is all about what was recovered in the Reformation. It is all about gospel, all about Jesus, all about the Bible, and all about the salvation of sinful men. This is it. This is our central business. This is what we testify to. But once it has done its work, what is this central business, what is this message of salvation supposed to affect? The answer is that it affects everything, and this takes us back to Psalm 90. This gospel doesn't just helicopter us out of the world. This is not the message that we need to hear if we want our soul to go to heaven when we die. And in the meantime, while we live here, we live pretty much like everybody else, at least the decent ones. So we look at the, the ordinary, civilized, decent, middle-class Americans. That's how they live. We are to live roughly in that ballpark. And the difference is we believed in Jesus, so we go to heaven when we die. The gospel does far more than that. The gospel saves individual sinners. The gospel saves families. The gospel saves tribes. The gospel saves churches. The gospel saves denominations. The gospel saves nations. The gospel is a gospel for this world. This message, what, the fact that Jesus died, was buried, rose again from the dead, that gospel, that gospel which we receive by faith alone, which is offered to us by grace alone, which we learn about through, through the, the scriptures alone, and so forth, all of that is a powerful uh, message, a, a potent force that came into this world in order to trans, uh, in, in order to um, uh, completely reverse and overthrow and transform the way the world was doing business before. So the world was in darkness, the world was covered over with darkness, and God determined to transform it. And this is why the, one of the great mottos in the Reformation was post tenebras lux. After darkness, light. After darkness, light. It is light of the gospel. So, one of the great practical applications of the Reformation. One of the great practical teachings of the, uh, of the Reformation had to do with the doctrine of vocation, the doctrine of calling. What, what are you supposed to do with your saved little life? All right? So you've been saved. What does that mean? You've been saved. What, how does that plug in? You've been saved. What does that mean for Tuesday afternoon? What does that mean for you this coming week? Now, we know that it means that if you were hit by a truck on Tuesday, you'd go to heaven. We know that. That's, it, it means at least that. People who are saved are saved from hell. People who are saved are saved from damnation. But they are saved to what? What, what are they saved to uh, prior to the, um, the, the resurrection, prior to the end of the world, prior to heaven? What are we saved to? For we are God's workmanship, it says in Ephesians 2.10, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to do. So, you've numbered your days. But those days that are numbered, what, what fills up your days? What fills up your days that have been numbered this way? Sweeping the floor, working on legal briefs, writing code, writing novels, changing diapers, driving a bus, washing windows, teaching children, managing an office, filing papers, answering the phone, swinging a hammer, studying at college, emptying the trash, counseling people, painting pictures, painting houses, doing graphic design, composing songs, troubleshooting computers, laying asphalt, manufacturing breakfast cereal, making movies, and deep-frying deep french fries. That's what God calls us to, and I hope you see that this is not an exhaustive list. <laughs> God calls us to everything. God calls us to transform everything. Now, we are not commemorating the appearance of a particular doctrine as though Luther 
were a comet that appeared in the sky and then went away again. We are not commemorating the 500th anniversary of when that comet appeared and, and astonished and scared a bunch of people and then went away and everything is the same as it was before. No, all the activities that I mentioned and every other lawful activity, any other lawful activity that there may be, all those activities mentioned above are marked on our calendars, are marked by our calendars. We have fiscal years, we have academic years, we have calendar years, we have different ways of marking our time and different businesses, different enterprises have different ways of watching and observing and managing the waxing and waning of their business. These are all calendar issues. Our vocation, our way of living our lives is something that occurs in history. It's marked by minutes and hours and days weeks and years. They occur in history and in time in the course of our lives. So when, we're, when the psalmist says um, that, we're, that we're to pray to God to have him number, uh, help us number our days, we are number, numbering our days of composing music. We are numbering our days of painting pictures. We are numbering our days sweeping out the warehouse. Now, it's very easy for us to think, oh, if, this is, if I want to be a really spiritual Christian, then I can't be sweeping out the warehouse. Right? That's not very spiritual. If I, if I, if I want to be a sold-out Christian for Jesus, I need to go into, um, terrible phrase, full-time Christian work. And when we talk, start talking about full-time Christian work, we are headed straight back into the medieval conception of holy people over here and ordinary people over there. More about that in a moment. So the, all these th things that we do, that we're called to do, are things that occur in history. We are not remembering, so on this 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we are not remembering 500 years of, uh, of, of the doctrine comet that came and went. We are not remembering the appearance of the doctrine comet. We are remembering 500 years of work, 500 years of suffering, 500 years of labor, 500 years of martyrdom, 500 years of sacrifice, 500 years of people doing things because God had saved them. God saved them and saved them not by good works, sola gratia, not by good works, but he most certainly saved them to good works. And the good works that they've been doing have been done in history, have been done in time, and as they've been done in history and in time, it has had a transforming effect on everything. So we are remembering 500 years of the work that grace accomplished, the culture and civilization that grace built, and that sin is currently occupied industriously in dismantling. The grace of God that appeared in the Reformation, that first appeared in the Reformation, built a civilization, and because we have gotten lazy, because we have forgotten our roots, because we have forgotten the gospel, because we have drifted off into sin and compromised ourselves, that civilization is currently being industriously dismantled and destroyed. It is being destroyed in front of us. We are watching it happen, and we are wondering how, how. How are they, why do they have so much authority? Why do they have so much power? How can they get away with that? And how can they get away with that? Well, we need to return to our roots. People who build, people who built a civilization can build another one. People who built a civilization can build another one. People who built a civilization can fight successfully to keep a civilization from being dismantled. So, this is the culture and civilization that Grace built the shaping and direction of human history that was accomplished and that was accomplished wonderfully. We are recounting, we are remembering 500 years of cumulative grace. Now, when God works in the world, he does, it does not take off like a space shuttle. It doesn't take off like a rocket ship. It's more like walking up the side of a mountain where you, you go up for a little ways and then down into a ravine and then further up the mountain and then down into a canyon then further up and then you have to go go. Uh, go left or go right. It, there are many twists and turns as you're going up the side of a mountain. It's the same way with reformations. It's the same way with human history. It's very easy for us to look back at, at, uh, at the reformed era and say, oh, that, 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 in that day, giants walked the earth. 
In that, in that day, they were, it was all, they, they, there was a holy glow around all of them, and people listened to them wherever they went. Well, no. Uh, when, the, when the reformers were walking uh, to church, when the reformers were going different places, they were not walking by great big statues of themselves. They, they were renegades. They were outlaws. They were wanted men. It was, um, it was a bigger uh, mess than it is now. It was a bigger mess than it is now. And yet, they were faithful, and God did a wonderful thing. So we are, rec- we are recovering, recounting, remembering 500 years of cumulative grace, some of, wh- some of which we have let slip away, but there's a lot left that has not yet slipped away. Now, there's a certain kind of spiritual mindedness, given some of the activities mentioned that God assigns to us. Sweeping floors, filing papers, answering the phone. It would seem to a, to a certain sort of spiritually minded person, I put spiritually minded in quote, scare quotes, it would seem that God is not very high minded. How is God high minded if he wants to save the world and what he, what he says, because I want to save the world, that's why you are at the drive-in window handing hot french fries out to people. And that's why he wants you to wear a paper hat. That's, God wants to save the world. That's why you're swimming, swinging a hammer. God wants to save the world. That's why you work at an, on a dairy farm. God wants to save the world. That's why you're fishing in Alaska. God wants to save the world. That's why you're working in, in, um, in a legal office and so on. It would seem to us that God's not very high-minded. If he, if he wants to save everybody, shouldn't we all quit our jobs and buy tracks with whatever money we get um, and go out and give, give away tracks? Yeah, that would last about three weeks, and then we'd be out of tracks. And then after that, we'd be out of food. And then after that, we would all compromise and say, oh, I guess Jesus doesn't want us to do this. Uh, he must want us to live for the devil. And we go back and take, our, take up our station again, but not taking up our station as though God put us there, but b- taking up our station again because we think, oh, the full-time Christian work thing that's a delusion. That you, you, you better not be an enthusiast. You better not go all in with this sort of stuff. No, the problem isn't our premise. The problem is with the spiritual mindedness that's not really spiritually minded. Our notions of true spirituality and God's notions of true spirituality often vary. Luke 16, 15. That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Men esteem it highly. Men say, man, that's a spiritual thing. That was one lengthy prayer in the synagogue. That was a, that was a great lengthy prayer, and God detests it. Man, he, he sure showed them praying on the street corner like that, and God detests it. Right? God, there are things that God says not to do, and we think that we're going to impress him by doing them anyway with with a great deal of industry. No, that which is highly, there is a type of piety, there's a type of spiritual mindedness that is not spiritual at all. Remember that he is the one who thought up a Messiah in a manger. Manger has um, Christmas connotations, so say feed trough instead, right? Say feeding bowl instead. God's the one who decided that he was going to send his Messiah, he's going to send his own beloved son, and he's going to be wrapped up in swaddling clothes, and he's going to be put where the cow was just eating. That's where he's going to be put. God's the one who thought of that. God is the one who thought up a Savior nailed to a tree. He's the one who thought up a Savior stripped naked, flogged, mistreated, spat upon, and nailed to a tree. That was God's idea. Not only was that God's idea, that was God's idea of salvation for everyone. Do you see why Jacob would not have been able to guess what God was up to in the disappearance of Joseph? God does not do predictable things, except when he predicts, except when he's the one predicting. And when he predicts it, he can predict it overtly. And we are so blinded by our our, uh, our notions of spiritual mindedness that we can read the text in Isaiah and still not get it. Jesus could show the disciples before, before his crucifixion and his re- resurrection. Jesus could open the Old Testament and say, see, here, 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 here. I've got to go to Jerusalem. I've got to be crucified. I'm going to rise again from the dead. And they're thinking, what on earth could he possibly mean? 
He couldn't mean Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He couldn't mean crucifixion, crucifixion. He couldn't mean resurrection, resurrection, because that's not high-minded. God is the one who does things that we don't regard as high-minded. But here's a, here's a wonderful paradox. In Isaiah 57, it says this, For thus saith the high and lofty one, God really is, if you consider it truly, God really is high and lofty. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So God is the high and lofty one. God is the high and lofty one. He is the one who inhabits eternity. He, he dwells in infinite glory in unapproachable light God is beyond all mortal calculus. His name is ultimate holiness. He is holy, holy, holy. He dwells in the high and holy place. And where else does he dwell? He dwells with the lowly. That's how it works. God is the high and holy one. He dwells in infinite, he, he, he inhabits eternity. He dwells in the infinite. And where else does he dwell? in a humble and a contrite heart, in a lowly sinner who bows before him. That's where God dwells. He dwells with the lowly. God's calculus of worthwhileness is not the same as ours. Charles Williams once said, the altar is often built in one place so that the fire can fall in another place. God works that way. And so it is that he deigns to dwell God deigns to dwell with losers like us. God deigns to dwell with losers like us. Losers predestined to be conformed to the likeness of the very Son of God. That's what we're predestined to. Predestined to that glory. We, we are given the gift of being made partakers of the divine nature. Warehouse, sweepers of warehouses people who, who cook french fries, people who drive a bus, people who wash windows. Now, this is where the Reformation had its impact. This is how the Reformation had its impact. One, th this is one of the principal fruits of it. Remember, we're not commemorating the Doctrine Comet. We're not, we're not commemorating five comets in a row. There goes Sola Scriptura. There goes Sola Fide. It's not comets in the sky. What were the, one of the principal fruits of people learning these things, the gospel being preached to them, is that it utterly transformed absolutely everything that they set their hands to. One of the principal fruits of the Reformation was the restoration of the dignity of the work of the ordinary man and woman. That was one of the principal fruits of the Reformation, and it's why the Reformation was so potent. Everybody mattered. A waitress is just as called to her vocation as a minister is to his. You don't have to be called. Of course, ministers, church planters, evangelists, missionaries should be called to their work. If it's your vocation, and, and that comes from the Latin word for call, all right? If it's your vocation, it's your calling. Called by whom? Called by God. If you, if you go into church planting, if you go into ministry, if you go into preaching the gospel, of course you should be called. But if you want to be a building contractor, you should also be called. If you want to be a computer programmer, you should also be called. If you want to be a uh, stay-at-home mom, you should be called to that. Right? Do you see that? God calls us, everyone, everyone in this room is called. Everyone is called. Because everything matters. The God of the Reformation is a God who is, if we may speak this way, an in-your-face God. He's a sovereign God. One of the things that was recovered is the proclamation of the exhaustive sovereignty of God, which means that he is in, through, behind, above, and under everything. Absolutely everything. So, we are not divided into a two-tier system where the clerics are holy and the grubby laity pay the bills. Right? That's, in the medieval setup, 
there was a rood screen, R-O-O-D, a rood screen in the front of the cathedral. Everybody that conducted the worship service was ordained and was behind the screen, and the congregation came out, and they, were, they couldn't even watch. They, all they could do was listen. Right? They were out there, and, and they were required to partake of the Lord's Supper once a year. What the Reformation did was it tore down that rood screen. It established the priesthood of all believers. That's what happened. The congregation was all of a sudden included in the work that God was called the kingdom of God to do. There was a, well, I think he's a fortunately named um, reformer. His name was John Oikolampadius. Um, he was the reformer in Basel, and he, uh, his name means house lamp. So he was, he, was the, he was an assistant to Erasmus early on, and he was, he was a, an important reformer there. And one, one Christmas day, I think it was a Christmas day or Christmas Eve service, uh, the congregation startled everyone by singing. The congregation, can you believe it? The congregation sang something. They broke out, they broke out into song. That's not permitted. Uh, and the... And, the congregation, when they were told by the authorities that it wasn't permitted, um, kept singing. No, it is permitted. We are all called. We are all called to worship God, and we're all called to go out into the world, into every lawful vocation, and there establish a base camp for the advancement of the gospel. That's what's happening. A gospel that reaches down to every person has the effect of lifting up every person. And this is why, for just one more bit of Latin, we are enabled to live out every aspect of our lives, coram Deo, before God. Every aspect of our lives is lived out, coram Deo. God cares about all of it. God is glorified in all of it. In other words, we, we are not in charge of what the definition of glorifying God is. We're not in charge of that. We are servants, we, are, we have been adopted, we've been brought into the kingdom, we are to obey. And if you say, well, it seems to me that it would be more important to be a, a, a missionary than an engineer. Well, it's more important to be a missionary than an engineer if you're called to be a missionary. It's more important to be an engineer than a missionary if you're called to be an engineer. You need to walk with God. You need to exercise your gifts. You need to internalize the gospel, worship God every week, and then go out into the world and shine the light wherever you are. So this is why R.C. Sproul rightly says, right now counts forever. Right now counts forever, and right now counts forever, forever everywhere, in everything. Consider these two passages, Romans 12, 1 and 2. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means where, whatever your body's doing, if it's, if it's lawful, that body is, be, is on, on an altar. The car you're driving is an altar. The bed you're sleeping on is an altar. The desk you're working at is an altar because your body is a living sacrifice. Everything is offered up to God. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, not just you elders, not just you deacons, not just you church rulers, you bro brothers. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, this is your reasonable service. All right, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice that you're proving, establishing, testing, establishing a beachhead for the will of God in every place, <coughs> at every, in every business, in every location. Scatter, go. All right, that's what's happening. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or what, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Notice these are very mundane activities. Eating and drinking are incidental activities. You stop at a drinking fountain and you have a sip because you're a little bit thirsty. Do that to the glory of God. Now, what is the doctrinal infrastructure that, it makes, that makes it possible for those sorts of lowly activities to glorify God? Well, what was recovered in the Reformation 
is the doctrinal infrastructure. It's not just this distant comet. It's a doctrinal infrastructure that was planted. It was seed planted in the ground, and it bears fruit in people's lives. The gospel bears fruit in people's lives, and you've heard me say it many times. This is another place where it will come out again. That Your doctrine, what your worldview, your theology comes out your fingertips. Your theology comes out your fingertips. And whatever it is that's coming out of your fingertips, that is your theology. And Reformation theology, Reformation experiential, experimental Calvinism, experiential Reformation theology is engaged. It applies to everything. It's lived out. There, it, it swallows up every form of hypocrisy. It swallows it up. It eats it away. And so that is what God has called you to do. That is what God has called me to do. This is the message. I have a message to you from God. Live like a Christian. Live like a Christian, not on Sunday. Live like a Christian on Monday. This is the message from God for you. Live like a Christian now, today. Whenever it's called today, live like a Christian. Live like someone who means it. Live like someone who has been saved by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father... Father of Jesus Christ, giver of the Holy Spirit, we pray to you now asking you to make us a grateful people, eager to thank you for all your kindness to us. Surround us with the holy armor of gratitude, we pray. As we pray to you, we return the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, it is not a coincidence that the fall of our race into sin involved food. God created Adam and Eve and placed them in a garden full of food and placed one tree in that garden off limits. They were not to eat of that one tree. All the other trees were open to them, and the Lord used to come down to walk with them in the cool of the day. This, there is at least, therefore, one hint that when the Lord came down to commune with them, he would eat from the trees in the garden. The serpent each urges them to eat from the prohibited tree so that they might become like him. Perhaps Adam and Eve were tempted to think the Lord knew good and evil, not because of who he was simply, but because he was eating from that tree. And if they ate, then perhaps they could catch up. Maybe they could be like him. Only perhaps. But regardless, wisdom eats, and so does folly. It is therefore not surprising that our salvation involves food. God ate with the elders of Israel on the mountain in the days of Moses. He ate with Abraham on the great day of the promise concerning Isaac in Genesis 18. The entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament involved food. And so now we come to this table. We ought not to make Adam's mistake thinking that we can accomplish anything simply by eating. We eat and drink our salvation, it is true, but we also are capable of eating and drinking damnation. The chewing, tasting, and swallowing are common to both. The thing that distinguishes is evangelical heart religion. Faith, hope, and love chew and swallow. So do unbelief, cynicism, and malice. The chewing and swallowing in themselves are nothing, but also everything. What matters is love, joy, peace in the Holy Spirit. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. The charge is this. Remember the psalm we ended with, Psalm 68, was a Huguenot battle song. It was the song that they uh, used to sing when they were preparing for battle, physical battle, actual battle. And we should take it to heart. God will arise, and by his might, he will, in fact, put his enemies to flight. The message of the gospel is that God knows what he's doing. He intends to save this world. That means at the end of the process, victory will be his. The world will be saved. And so go out with that song in your heart, that song in your mouth. God will arise and by his might put all his enemies to flight. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.